Asseyez-vous, that's French for sit down, we're going to go. Uh, my performance is monitored closely by the ASMSC staff, and I certainly wouldn't want to get a bad report. So we're going to start, and uh, I think it's a good time, before I get into the agenda, I'm going to turn to Roy Miller while you're settling down. Roy has an announcement um, that he'd like to make, so Roy, you go ahead and start with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to remind the folks at, at this wonderful meeting uh, that there's an opportunity available to all of us out in the hallway uh, to do some good for the Take a Kid Fishing program. And uh, participation apparently thus far has been a, a tad on the low side because we've had such a busy schedule. But if you can possibly carve out a few minutes to step across the hallway in, into the uh, uh, angling area and participate in the casting program I, and um, are willing to make your contribution, receive a nice T-shirt and support the program, I'm sure the Take a Kid Fishing program uh, would welcome your participation and the folks that put that together would welcome it as well. So thank you for that quick opportunity. Thank you, Roy. Uh, so we're going to go on with the agenda, and you do have um, the ability to be here for a short time today. The agenda is set for 45 minutes, and what I'd like to do is get some consent items out of the way. You have the agenda. Are there any changes or modifications to the agenda? See none, going to have that by consent on approval. And also we have proceedings from February 2018. Um, are there any comments on the proceedings from February 2018? So by consent, we'll approve those. Um, at this time, we have the public comment for those who have individuals who have something to inform the board of or ask of the board but who signed up and items that are not on the agenda. I don't have anything here, but I will ask if there's anyone who wishes to um, speak to the board at this time. And not seeing any, we'll move to the technical committee report on commercial discards. Um, Dr. Drew and Dr. Schmidtke are here. Um, so they, they have been working with the technical committee on this report and um, Mike will give a report now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the last Weakfish board meeting, uh, the board tasked the technical committee with looking at discard data from the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program, as well as uh, vessel trip reports, uh, to look and see if occurrences of commercial trips approaching the 100-pound trip limit or exceeding the 100-pound trip limit have increased and to characterize uh, fisheries that have substantial weak fish disc discards to determine if different trip limits are needed. The, techn the technical committee approached this task uh, by gathering trip level data from the states as well as looking at uh, federal trip reports and information from the Northeast Fisheries Observer Program. A subgroup of Weakfish TC members was formed and those three TC members gained confidential access and worked with Katie and myself to uh, look, at the, look at the data that was there. Data were divided up uh, and filtered out to look at the number and percentage of trips that were greater than or equal to 100 pounds as well as the number and percentage of the poundage that came from those trips that were greater than or equal to 100 pounds. We also looked at some, uh, some gillnet gear, gear specific information as well as trips greater than or equal to 90 pounds just to cover some bases in case we were missing any trends um, not conveyed by our initial analyses. Here we see the trends for percentage of trips greater than or equal to 100 pounds from the state data and the federal data. As you can see, there's kind of a mix-up of those trends, but nothing, nothing really stands out as strongly increasing. Uh, it's fairly flatlined for most. 
the motivation for for this task came primarily from anecdotal reports out of North Carolina and Virginia and as you can see towards the end of those time series 2016 shows uh, that one year increase for Virginia that's bolded in uh, in the red and then North Carolina the bolded blue line uh, also showed an increase at the end of the time series nothing on the long term but there is that that one year that we saw there Similar type of trend was uh, conveyed through the percentage of pounds that were caught on these trips greater than or equal to 100 pounds. Um, same, same type of thing, 2016 Virginia showed that one year increase and then there was a, a slight uptick for North Carolina at the end of the time series, both for the state and the federal data. Looking at the information from the, uh, from the Fisheries Observer Program as far as the percentage of weak fish pounds discarded, there was really a less clear trend there, a lot more variation uh, looking at the time period that, that we were investigating. So the trends that we were talking about before weren't even strongly evident in this, uh, in this data set. So the conclusions uh, that the TC formed were that there was no increasing trend in discards that would be a cause for concern. They noted single year increases for Virginia and North Carolina corroborate the anecdotal reports, but they do not suggest a longstanding increase. Uh, and they would not recommend any management changes at this time. However, if uh, these anecdotal reports continue in future years, then a similar analysis could be conducted to, to see if, if there's some type of long-standing trend that becomes apparent. And with that, I can take any questions. Questions for Mike? Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I saw the there's logbook data, states, uh, federal VTRs. Did you guys investigate, uh, and I'm not suggesting to repeat the analysis, but just to, to offer uh, some of the electronic reporting that's going on, and I wonder if that might be a data set that could be um, interrogated to get a little bit more refined data. I think a lot of those, um, I guess they're mostly projects at this point, but I think the folks who participate in them have been fairly consistent for, for a few years, and that might be another data source to not only get um, numbers and, and pounds, but also some information about uh, a length structure as well. Are you, are, you, are you referring to recreational or commercial electronic reporting? So there's both going on, and so I, yeah, just a, a general look at the recreation, um, the electronic rather information that, that's available, just as a, another. Um, you know, there's always so much variability in, in um, the consistency and the reporting on some of the kind of standard um, forms, you know, creates a lot of that variability. So I, I, some of these electronic reporting platforms, whether they be commercial or recreational, I think would be valuable for these types of analyses. Obviously, the, you know, the electronic reporting on the commercial side was included in the in the trip level data that we looked at on the commercial side, um, but we could certainly in the future look into the recreational component of that as well. And as you say, get maybe get some more length structure information out of that compared to what we looked at. Adam Nowalski. I think the board task was very specific in terms of the scope of what we wanted looked at and analyzed and appreciate the direct response to that. Uh, Jay brought up one additional data set. Was there any conversation? My understanding is you had four conference calls to go ahead and do this analysis, but was there discussion about other sources you think the board might ask you to look at that might give you more information? Uh, heard some anecdotal information about bycatch, for example, in the shrimp fishery. Uh, are those, is that a data set you could look at? Did you have any discussion about what other things, other fisheries the board could potentially task you to look at to give us more information? So we didn't talk specifically about um, 
shrimp, the example that you brought up, I know kind of the way that um, the way that the data was queried, they looked for any any trips where weak fish were caught. Uh, you know, they looked across several different uh, a number of different fisheries uh, where those would have been the target species, but weak fish happened to be caught there. So, um, I'm. I'm not sure of other data sources um, that, you know, we tried to shake as many trees as we could as far as the state, the federal, the, the observer program as well. Um, but if there are additional items to look at, I'm sure that the TC could take a, you know, take another look at those. Other questions? Tom Fody. When we first started doing the weak fish, it was a, uh, one of the big problems was the actually the shrimp fishery because the, the discards of, of a shrimp in both South Carolina and North Carolina on, on croaker spots and uh, immature weak fish. And we really haven't talked about that in years. Or in, I haven't seen any real data as a guard. Now, I know we, on the offshore ones, we, on the fly net fishery and a few others, we put a fish excluding devices on that basically was there, but, but I, have, I have no idea what we've been doing in the last, the last, since the last benchmark stock assessment in 2009, and I'd like to get an update on that, if North Carolina could be helpful. Chris Patch Savage. Yeah, th thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to uh, Tom Fody's question, um, I forget which amendment it was, might have been Amendment 3, uh, closed uh, the use of uh, fly net trawls south of Cape Hatteras. That was one of the big conservation um, um, actions uh, to reduce uh, discards and high catches of, of weak fish uh, along the range, particularly south of Cape Hatteras, where there was uh, heavy concentrations in the, in the wintertime. Uh, there is also some mesh size restrictions put uh, in place, I think, during that same amendment that were also for trawls and for uh, gill nets, uh, also designed to uh, reduce uh, discards of, of weak fish. Uh, since 2009, um, you know, directly for weak fish, it was the management measures put in place, which essentially made it a bycatch fishery, uh, is, is what uh, we followed as long as, as well as the other states. Um, indirectly, uh, just with the shrimp trawl fishery in North Carolina, uh, there's been work to uh, add excluder devices, uh, bycatch excluder devices to the, uh, to the trawls to just reduce overall bycatch of, uh, of fin fish, and uh, there's uh, plans to, or the Marine Fisheries Commission approved uh, additional uh, reduction devices to be put in place in Pamlico Sound uh, starting next summer, I believe. So, uh, like I guess it doesn't directly address weak fish, but you know, since shrimp trawl bycatch was, was brought up as uh, an issue uh, identified in the past, I thought I'd just add that information for the board's benefit. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Tom Fody. You still have the rule in place that you can't bait, because it used to be the bycatch became in use and they used it for crab bait and things like that. And I think when Bill Holgar basically put a rule in many years ago that he couldn't do that, he couldn't sell it anymore, so it wasn't, there was no value on have, bringing the discard in. Chris Batch Savage. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, to, to answer that, uh, there's, I think there's a, uh, there's a I guess it's called a scrap fish or uh, a scrap fish limit uh, for high volume fisheries such as the fly net fishery, uh, the long haul sand fishery. Uh, that that caps the amount of uh, of you know, bait basically that uh, that the the boats can bring in, and uh, you know, weak, weak fish would be part of that bait component at times. Uh, you know, and I can't remember where it shakes out it's probably it's it's not top of the list but uh that that's that's been in place for a while i can't remember if that was put in place during amendment three or not but there's been nothing additional i will say though just in terms of those two fisheries uh the long haul seine and the fly net fishery in north carolina the uh the effort is very minimal now compared to 25 years ago john clark Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike, was there any investigation of uh, what was being targeted in the, by, by the gillnet fisheries that were investigated and whether they were fishing in any 
places that were different in this? Uh, there, there wasn't anything of like target species, and it, it really probably would have been difficult to discern target species with the data sets that were look that were looked at. We could have seen other species that were caught with weak fish in gill nets, but not necessarily if those were, you know, targeted specifically. Um, but no, like once once we saw that there wasn't anything apparent from the gill net specific. There wasn't anything further that went into species within gill nets. Chris Batch Savage. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a uh, question on the uh, discard analysis in this paper, uh, and it you know, clearly didn't show any trends, but I uh, was wondering uh, were, were there any particular fisheries or gear types that? Uh, uh, showed a higher tendency of weak fish discards, and with the weak fish discards uh, shown in the uh, the figure, it's in percentages. What were the range of pounds of weak fish discarded in these trips? Was it you know, tens of pounds, thousands of pounds, or did it vary pretty widely uh, throughout the years and states? So um, we, I don't have the, we don't have the exact poundage uh, right now. We could look into that. I think part of the issue is that the sample size is very low, and that's really what's driving this incredible variability, is that this is from the federal um, observer program, and as a result, they're not really s sampling a lot of trips that would encounter weak fish very often. So I think um, the, the high variability is really driven by the few number of samples. So even if we could give you some numbers on that, I wouldn't necessarily trust them to reflect what's really happening, especially at the state level, where probably that discarding is a bigger concern than, the, than what you're going to see in the Federal Observer Program. Any additional questions? OK, so um, my thought is that this is really good of the Technical Committee and uh, Katie and Mike to go forward with this analysis. I don't think it's over. I think there will be more coming our way. Um, my understanding of the discards, the first alert I had from that was actually from North Carolina in 2016, and then I know that Chris Bat Savage also received reports as well of over the 100 uh, pounds with discards. Um, in Virginia, the discards are a little different, whereas the North Carolina situation was well offshore, about 30 miles offshore is what I was informed, um, for the croaker fishery going on in the winter. Um, that, but that was not 2017, that was 2016. In the Virginia situation, it's more state waters following the migration up the coast and back down the coast, and there certainly have been reports from industry that the 100 pounds is, you know, pretty tough to adhere to, and there are discards. So I think there'll be more information on this. I think the opportunity to gain more information is to keep up the contacts with our industries, because they're the ones who have informed us of the situation. Um, if we keep in touch with them, it's even possible at some time to, uh, you know, get some observer coverage in state waters, even. So I think that's the the future route here. We are hoping that we do see more um, weak fish. That's the aim here. Um, and so I, I think probably uh, the early work done now is good, and we'll just wait and see where this goes from here. Thank you. So we're definitely on schedule. And we're now going to consider approval of the 2018 Fishery Management Plan Review and State Compliance Reports. And Mike Schmidtke is going to present that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the uh, Weak Fish Plan, Plan Review Team uh, got together on a conference call and uh, put together the 2018 FMP review. Uh, the first item that we wanted to address is in July of this year, MRIP recalibrated recreational harvest estimates from the Coastal Household Telephone Survey to the new mail-based fishing effort survey. 
uh, time series of harvest by numbers of fish using each effort calibration are shown here with the telephone survey in gray and the new mail survey in black. The FES calibration on average increased estimates by about double. Uh, as this species is not managed based on an annual recreational quota, the recreational estimates presented today will use the FES survey numbers. However, it should be noted that the last assessment and the telephone survey estimate, uh, the last assessment used telephone survey estimates. Thus, reference points from that assessment should not be compared to the mail survey estimates and a new assessment uh, is scheduled to be conducted in 2019 to update those reference points and be reflective of, uh, of the new MRIP estimates. Weak fish harvests for both the commercial and recreational sectors have shown similar trends of decrease from the 1980s through the present. 2017 total harvest of weak fish was about 600,000 pounds with 28% of that coming from the commercial fishery. Uh, this was a 50% increase in total landings from 2016. Coastwide weak fish commercial harvest in 2017 was 167,000 pounds, which is a 5% decrease from 2016, and the third lowest harvest, commercial harvest on record. About half of the commercial harvest came from North Carolina, with New York and Virginia each harvesting about 15%. Coastwide weak fish recreational harvest in 2017 was 436,000 pounds, a 90% 90, 90 increase from 2016. About half of the recreational harvest by pounds came from New Jersey, with North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia each harvesting about 10%. Here we see recreational harvest by numbers in blue and re uh, releases in red. Since the mid-1990s, when Amendments 1 through 3 were implemented, Releases have typically been about three times the number of fish harvested, although with declining harvests in some years, releases have outnumbered recreational landings up to 20 times. Recreational landings in 2017 were 276,000 fish, representing a 65% increase uh, in numbers from 2016. By numbers, New Jersey harvested the largest percentage of recreational landings at about 30%, with North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia each harvesting about 20%. About 1.5 million weak fish, or 84% of the recreational catch, were released by the recreational fishery. This was a 55% decrease in the number of releases and uh, also a decrease in the percentage of catch released from 2016. Addendum 1 to Amendment 4 requires the collection of otoliths and lengths to characterize the fishery. The number of samples required is based on the magnitude of each state's fisheries, such that six fish lengths are collected for each metric ton of weak fish landed commercially, and three ages are collected for each ton of, weak, of total weak fish landed. Uh, it should be noted that the age requirements that are shown on this table uh, and it, uh, they would also be reflected in Table 9 of the report. These are based on recreational landings estimates using the Coastal Household Telephone Survey, not the mail-based survey. The plan review team recommends maintaining sampling requirements based on the telephone survey until after completion of the next assessment, uh, also given the, the difficulty that, that several states have had in collecting even these numbers of samples uh, they would predictably increase for the age samples required with the, uh, the mail-based survey estimates. All states met the biological sampling requirements in 2017 except for New York. New York collected an adequate number of ages, but 36 lengths less than their required 84. This was the second consecutive year that New York has not collected an adequate number of lengths. There have been issues in sample collection uh, for several states recently, due at least in some part to the declining landings. The plan review team doesn't have any reason to believe that a good faith effort to fulfill the requirements was not put, uh, was not put forth by New York, especially given the substantial number of samples that were collected. Considering this is the second consecutive year without adequate sampling, the plan review team does recommend that New York consider as much as practical additional efforts towards sample collection in future years. Um, there was a conversation that the board had earlier this year 
uh, when it comes to a when it comes to age versus length sampling um, that age samples could potentially be supplemented with fishery independent information but lengths should not be they should be fishery dependent um, so it was noted that samples for Rhode Island and New Jersey came primarily from fishery independent sources uh, given the timing of the board's discussion and uh, the timing that this data was collected this would have been collected before that board discussion so the PRT would also recommend for Rhode Island and New Jersey to also consider as much as practical additional efforts towards fishery dependent length collection in future years in 2010 the recreational and commercial management measures from addendum 4 replaced those of addendum 2 However, the plan review team continues to evaluate the management triggers as they provide some perspective on the magnitude of the landings. Um, I won't touch on this further in the recommendations portion of the presentation, but in the FMP review, the PRT does maintain its recommendation that the board update these triggers to be reflective of the most recent stock assessment. So for the first trigger, uh, commercial management measures are to be re-evaluated re if coast-wide coast commercial landings exceed 80% of the mean landings from 2000 through 2004, or about 3 million pounds. This trigger was not met. Uh, the second trigger is for commercial and recreational management measures, and they're to be re-evaluated re if any single state's landings exceed its five-year mean by more than 25% in a single year. This occurred in 2017 for Massachusetts, New Jersey, Georgia, and Florida. Uh, for Massachusetts and Florida, um, both of those states are de minimis states, and the PRT doesn't find the magnitude of those landings to be incredibly concerning, even though they tripped the trigger. For New Jersey and Georgia, both of these states have shown similar sporadic increases in the past, particularly with respect to their recreational fisheries. Uh, the PRT does not recommend immediate management action for these states, but does recommend monitoring landings in these states for 2018 to see whether the observed increases are sustained. Um, just as a note to provide some perspective on what 2018 landings look like, through way 4, 2018 landings for New Jersey are 32,000 pounds and 11,000 pounds for Georgia. So they're, they seem to be back more towards normal levels for those states. Weak Fish is currently operating under Amendment 4 with associated addenda, the most recent of which, Addendum 4, established the coastwide one fish uh, recreational bag limit and the 100 pound commercial trip limit. The 2016 benchmark stock assessment determined that the stock is depleted and experiencing a high level of natural mortality, but not experiencing overfishing. Uh, the next assessment is an update that is scheduled for 2019. So the plan review team um, found that all states were in compliance with Amendment 4, as well as the associated addenda. De minimis can be requested uh, in the weak fish fishery by states who have a combined average commercial and recreational landings uh, that constitute less than 1% of the coastwide landings for the same uh, two year, for a two year period. De minimis was requested by Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Massachusetts and Florida meet the de minimis criteria. Um, as, However, uh, Connecticut exceeded the total landings, but that was by less than a tenth of a percent. So the PRT does not find this concerning and would recommend that all three of these states be granted de minimis status uh, for 2019. So to finalize the recommendations, the PRT recommends that the board approve the 2018 Weak Fish FMP review state compliance reports and de minimis status for Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. PRT also recommends that the board task the Stock Assessment Subcommittee with conducting an assessment in 2019 that would update reference points to, re to reflect uh, the most recent information as well as the MRIP transition to the mail-based survey. And finally, the PRT recommends that, uh, that the board would 
um, maintain the sampling requirements derived by the Coastal Household Telephone Survey uh, recreational estimates until a new assessment is completed. And with that, I can take questions. Thank you, Mike. And did the technical committee in looking at the triggers, going over the triggers, um, was one of the reasons to have sort of a wait was the MRIP change that why not wait until that is after the next um, assessment update? Um, I, I think the, the triggers, that could, be, that could be something either for after the assessment or if it's a relative figure, then it may be something that could, looked at, could be looked at a little bit sooner. We have the recreational estimates. Um, so if it's simply a relative to a certain time period, then it may be able to be looked at sooner, but the assessment could also provide some information on that. Thanks a lot. Questions for Mike? Adam Nowalski. When is the expected presentation of peer-reviewed update in 2019 to this board? Um, it won't be peer reviewed. This is just going to be a, essentially a turn of the crank update to go through with the new fishery, most recent set of data. Um, I think the, the TC still has to kind of decide on that based on what's the terminal year going to be and what's the, what are the data, how long it's going to take to pull together all the data. The other thing to consider is that this would also benefit the ERP work group's um, efforts to have new information on weak fish for some of those models to consider. So we would like to get it done sooner rather than later, but we don't have a firm deadline for the board yet. Adam? Would the lack of peer review still be accurate? Should this board task the SAS with updating the reference points using the new FES data? So I know at the federal level, all those assessments are going through peer review at that point. So what would happen should we do that tasking here? Um, so I think some of the federal ones are merely doing an operational update, which has a, doesn't have the same extent of peer review. So it's, but I think for our, and we can do whatever we want, regardless of whatever the feds are doing. But I think the, and I think it's something for the board to consider for sure, which is that we are, there's nothing really new to bring to the table for the weak fish in order to do a benchmark. Is it worth doing a benchmark for weak fish just to incorporate these new information? Or is the board going to benefit from having the, the information on trends and status um, with the new MRIP information regardless, even if it's just an update? We're not changing the definition of the reference points in any way. So the um, reference points that we're using right now are basically the SPR reference points for F, and then we project the population forward under those reference points and figure out where it stabilizes. So with the new MRIP data, we would expect that the population numbers are going to sort of scale up, but the trend is not really going to change. And so similarly, the reference points will use the same definition and they'll use that new updated data, but it's unlikely that the, the trend or the status will change because of that. So I think it would be up to the comfort level of the board to, in terms of do they consider this simply an update the way we usually do an update where we recalculate our reference points with new data or would they be more comfortable with a benchmark before they move forward with um, the reference points? I think in our opinion, like I said, we're not redefining them. We're just updating them with new data, and I think that falls within our traditional update framework, but it certainly is to the comfort level of the board. Adam. So, Mr. Chairman, are you looking to have this discussion and decision today, or would that be subject for a future board meeting? Specifically, the decision topics being, are we looking for a benchmark or just a turn of the crank update, and are we looking to go ahead and update the reference points with the new FES data? I believe those would be the decision points I've heard that we could potentially take on. My understanding is the update is suitable for now. I think one thing I was curious about and haven't asked for a couple of years is Dr. Joe had a very complex model um, 
that Dr. Drew and others were trying to streamline in order to be able to replicate that process, and I assume that's been done. But um, Adam, I think that uh, what Katie has said is probably correct, that the update is you know, just going to be fine for right now. Jay McNamee. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I agree with that sentiment. I, I guess I, I wonder, I'm thinking about the um, MRIP data, and I was actually interested to see the, so it's a little different than I think the MRIP calibration is showing up in some other species. It's trending kind of opposite, where it starts off a little wider and seems to, it's probably due to the scale of the data rather than the proportional change. But in any case, I, I, I guess I'm a little concerned that there might be a, a couple more dials to twist under the hood there. And I think you said this, Dr. Drew, but I, you know, if an update, maybe we need this to be a little bit more flexible than a, a normal update just to be able to, to deal with, I don't know, locking down a selectivity parameter or something to that effect. And so, um, I don't know, that's my only concern, but I, I do agree there is no new information other than a recalibrated version of old information. So an update should be adequate as long as they can tinker a little bit beyond just that data. So thank you, Jane. I think you're uh, describing the operational approach. And so I, I guess that that's something that Katie can comment on. The, I would say, and I similar to, to Adam's, relevant to Adam's question as well, is that I think we can do sort of a, um, we can go through the data collection and run the model and see what happens when we do this update. And as I said, I think it would benefit the ERP work group to do this work now. So even if we come to you guys and say, there's the, the data has changed the model performance significantly. We're not as comfortable with this as an update, and we recommend a benchmark going forward. I think that process would still benefit the ERP group, work group as well as the weak fish process. And so we can come to you and say, here's how the update process went, and we would recommend a benchmark. Or we can come back to you and say, everything went fine. This is what the new update numbers look like, and you guys can make that decision then. So I don't think you need to necessarily make a decision right now. We can continue forward with this work um, and then report back to you on how things are going, and you guys can make a decision at that point. Thank you, Katie. Tony Kearns. And just to follow up, Adam, on the reference point side of things, if the update needs us to redefine a portion of the reference point, we can do that through an addendum if needed. Otherwise, it would just continue. I'd it'd probably be doubtful if the, it's just a true update that much would need to be changed in terms of the reference points um, outside of the value itself um, of what it's where we're at. But the actual um, method that we use to evaluate the reference point wouldn't change. Okay, thank you, Tony. Any other questions? We are still on item five, and I'm searching for someone to provide a motion for the approval of the plan review, as well as for the three states that have requested de minimis, and these were also um, provided just a little while ago. So Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Emerson Hasbrook. Yes, so moved. <laughs> and if you want me to, okay, move to accept the 2018 FMP review and state compliance reports for weak fish and approve de minimis requests for Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Tom Fody, it's good. Thank you, Tony. I'm going to read it into the record. Move to accept the 2018 FMP review and state compliance reports for weak fish and approve de minimis requests for Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Florida. Uh, we can do a show of hands, or I can just ask you, has anyone not approved this motion? Raise your hand if that's the case. Uh, the motion is approved. Thank you very much. We have a couple of items left. 
One is the advisory panel. There is an advisory panel recommendation, and Tina Berger is somewhere close by. So in your briefing materials, um, a, a, uh, a request, a nomination for uh, Jeff Buckle to be appointed to the Weak Fish Advisory Panel was given to you. Jeff is a, um, a researcher at NC State University as well as a uh, recreational uh, fisherman, and um, that's up for your approval. So Chris Batch Savage had made the recommendation. Any comments? Chris, thank you. Uh, no, no comments other than I think you'd be a, a very strong uh, advisory panel member and provide a lot of information. But with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, Jeff Buckle, uh, approve the nomination for Jeffrey Buckle to the Weak Fish Advisory Panel. A second is coming from Steve Bowman, it looks like. No, next to Steve Bowman. Okay, all right. Any of, thank you, Tony. That's twice. Third time, and I'm going to fall through the floor. I know it. Uh, any objection to the motion? Seems to be no objection. Uh, welcome, Jeff Buckle, and thank you, Chris. We have to elect a vice chair at this time. Is there someone who might propose a candidate for vice chair to the Weak Fish Management Board? Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would um, uh, nominate uh, Mr. John Clark to be uh, our vice chair. Thank you. Is there a second to that? Okay. Robert Boyles. Any other nominations? Robert, would you do your part about acclamation and closing the nominations for us? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would move that uh, we close the nominations and by acclamation and point uh, Mr. John Clark of the first state as vice chair of the Weak Fist Management Board. Thank you. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Tom Foti. I guess if I'm going to do this for the new, some of the new commissioners around, sitting around the table. Some of you should understand that how important weak fish is to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, then Congressman Carper, who then became governor of Delaware, then senator from Delaware, back in 92, put in a bill to do the same thing we had done with striped bass on weak fish, and they were going to do the weak fish emergency action bill. Instead, Jack Dunnigan and a lot of the state directors talked to him, and instead of that, it came out the Atlantic Coast Conservation Act. So the bill was driven that put the Atlantic Coast Conservation Act that basically gives, gave the commission the power to do this was really because of weak fish back then in 94, the driving force. It is one of my happiest days and one of my biggest disappointments over the years because we did everything right with weak fish, I thought, as far as management-wise. We changed the fisheries. I mean, back then they were using weak fish for cat, cat food. We were killing f weak fish at six inches. Now every fish is sexually mature before we harvest it. And we saw it start coming back, and for some reason it did not. And it's one of my big disappointments because I have, I don't understand why we sit here and we speculate on the answers to it, but it should be a fishery that should be expanded. We've done everything right in the list. 20 years and it still hasn't come back. Um, I know a lot of fish like to eat weak fish, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it becomes prey to a lot of the other species, but it should be some other reason. So, it's, again, I just figured I'd just put that on for all the new commissioners out there. Thank you, Tom. I share everything you said. In 1990, um, I joined the ASMSC process, uh, having weak fish 
as the first species involved with the technical committee. So um, it's a special uh, fish, there's no doubt about it. And we do hope for some resurgence of some type, get some signs somewhere. Um, from what I know from the last approach we had from the technical committee, recruitment really isn't the biggest problem. So there are other problems. So thank you again. Roy Miller. I'd just like to quickly add to what Tom said and you said, Rob. Um, it, it, we were talking before the meeting started. It's hard to believe how abundant weak fish were in the mid-Atlantic area uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s up until around 1990. It's hard to describe. We used to have to hire boat ramp attendants to keep order at our boat ramps because it was chaos uh, at, at the boat ramps without the attendants. Um, and uh, there was wanton waste going on. There were so many weak fish being captured. It's just hard to describe to anyone who didn't live through that particular experience. Uh, so. Oh, and our sport fishing tournament, we started off at a two pound minimum entry weight for weak fish. During the peak of, of the weak fish abundance, that went up to 11 pounds. And, and now it's way back down again. So just to add a little historical perspective, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Any other comments before we adjourn? If everyone's all right, we're going to adjourn. Thank you very much. We'll start the horseshoe crab board at 11.15, and this is a perfect time to get in that last minute fishing. <laughs>